Tropane is a bicyclic scaffold that turns up in a lot of natural products, and in particular you can see it's related here to tropinone, and Sir Robert Robinson did a very famous synthesis of this in 1917. It's a real landmark in the field of organic synthesis. Uh, here are just a handful of tropane containing natural products, so scopine, uh, with an ester at this position you have scopolamine, which is an important anticholinergic drug. Uh, cocaine, of course, is a well-known stimulant. Erisibiline is a dihydroxylated and N-methylated tropane. Um, and as for the subject of this video, uh, Baogong Tang A, you can see it's got the oxygenation pattern uh, in a slightly different position relative to erisibiline. Baogong Tang A was of interest as an anti-glaucoma medication, so it was known that this natural product could be isolated from various Chinese herbs, and when formulated as eye drops, this was effective in the treatment of glaucoma, but really the limiting factor was the scarcity of the herbs to extract the natural compound. And so this paper was published in 1992 by uh, Michael Jung from the University of California, working in collaboration with Zheng Longmei and co-workers from Zhongshan University. And they developed a much more scalable route to be able to obtain larger quantities of this compound to test its biological effects. The centerpiece of this synthesis is the disconnection of the two carbon unit from the bottom of the piperidine ring, uh, bringing us back to these two starting materials here, an aromatic building blocker, 3-hydroxypyridine, and acrylonitrile to provide the extra two carbons, as well as the acetate group, and you'll see how that's formed later on. Uh, this work is based on a publication by Dennis and uh, co-workers from 1976, and this is a really uh, fascinating paper that goes into a lot of detail about these class of cycloaddition reactions, which are very powerful uh, um, disconnections. Uh, the first step here is simply to alkylate the pyridine with benzoyl bromide, and that proceeds in a very good yield to afford the quaternary salt. And then the next step is where it gets interesting. So treatment of the quaternary salt with triethylamine in the presence of acrylonitrile. Look at the immediate increase in structural complexity you get. You get the, the cycloaddition between the acrylonitrile and the pyridinium ring. And we've gone from two completely flat and unsaturated building blocks to this very sp3 rich and structurally complicated scaffold. And the only thing that's a bit of a shame is that the desired compound is the exo product here. Of course, it's a, it's a deals older reaction. We can get exo and endo. Um, exo is the minor product in this case because, as we know, the, the endo product is uh, formed by the stabilizing secondary orbital interaction. Uh, fortunately, both of these compounds were separable fairly straightforwardly through conventional chromatographic techniques. Um, and the low yield doesn't necessarily matter because this can be done on a really quite large scale. In the paper, this reaction is done on a 20 gram scale, so they're able to obtain plenty of material. This cycloaddition is a particularly interesting reaction, so I think it's worth looking at in a bit more detail. The first thing that happens is triethylamine comes and deprotonates our hydroxy group to afford an oxyanion here. And in this case, the product is a betaine. And that's a certain kind of zwitter ion where you have an overall neutral molecule but with these internal charges that cancel each other out. And these betanes uh, react in such a way where the aromaticity of the pyridine ring can be disrupted uh, during the cycloaddition. And we need to rationalize the cycloaddition by pushing some arrows. We can do that in a, a couple of different ways, but this this doesn't quite look like your standard deals alder reaction, which would be something like this. We have to reconfigure the electrons a little bit in the pyridine ring to make the mechanism work. Uh, so one way you can look at it, you can push the electrons from the oxyanion here down next to the nitrogen to give us an anion at this position. And then we have four electrons in a three atom system. So that gives us a, a four pi component to our cycloaddition, and the two pi component, of course, here is the acrylonitrile. Now we can also rationalize the reaction using the other part of the pyridine ring as well. So if we take these electrons and put them back into the nitrogen to neutralize it and give us a cation next to the nitrogen, uh, we can spread the charge over these five atoms but again, we have a cation and then two pi bonds, so it's still a, a four pi component. Uh, so whichever way you draw this reaction, it's going to give you the same product. And so in this case, you could draw the mechanism 
something like this, the electrons coming down from the oxyan ion and then the acrylonitrile reacting with the cation here. Uh, the top case it's a little bit more simple, you have the anion directly adding into the acrylonitrile and acrylonitrile reacts with the cation here. So either mechanism that you draw, uh, you get this cycloadduct as the product. I've mentioned on the previous slide they can do it in a very good scale, so 20 grams uh, with the exo to endo ratio uh, we discussed, unfortunately the exo being the minor product. And the interesting thing about this reaction is whilst we do see the endo to exo mixture, uh, what we don't see is any regioselectivity issue because of course the acrylonitrile could react facing the other way around, uh, but none of this product is actually observed, so we only see two of the four possible products we could get from this deals older. And so in that single very powerful cycloaddition step, uh, the entire scaffold has now been established and all that remains is to change some functional groups around. And you'll remember from the, the structure of the target molecule here, uh, Jung and co-workers want the axial hydroxy in this position. They explored a number of ways to affect the reduction of the ketone here. A lithium aluminium hydride was powerful enough to do a, a conjugate reduction of the double bond as well as take the ketone down to the alcohol, but unfortunately it gives the uh, equatorial or endo alcohol, so the, the wrong relative disposition there to the rest of the molecule. Sodium borohydride uh, gave the desired axial alcohol here, uh, but it didn't touch the double bond, so it was necessary to use a two-step process. So palladium on carbon with one atmosphere of hydrogen uh, reduces out the double bond in the first step. And then sodium borohydride was used in a second step to give the major product of the axial alcohol and a small amount of the equatorial diastereomer, which could be separated by chromatography. And there's some interesting experimental data towards characterizing these two compounds because, as you could imagine, it's not necessarily trivial to distinguish between these products to work out whether you have the endo or the exo alcohol. And nowadays, NMR is a lot more widespread and we'd probably be looking for the coupling constant to determine whether where our alcohol was because, as we know from the Carplus relationship, the um, coupling between these two diaxial protons will be a lot stronger uh, than the coupling between that proton and either ones on the carbon next door because of the relative angle. Um, what uh, Jung and co-workers actually show is the infrared spectrum, which we tend not to think about much these days, but it was useful in this case. Um, so in the case of the equatorial alcohol, the OH stretching frequency turns up as a broad peak at 3500 as you'd expect from the hydroxyl group. Uh, for the axial alcohol uh, the infrared peak is very sharp and they attribute this to an internal hydrogen bond so because of the position of the hydroxyl here uh, it can actually get tied up in an internal hydrogen bond with the nitrogen lone pair and that renders the uh, absorption a lot, a lot sharper. And also the melting point uh, is another interesting observation here. This molecule, 139 degrees centigrade versus 71 melting point for the axial alcohol. Again, th that is presumably due to this internal hydrogen bond. In this molecule on the right, uh, the hydrogen bond is, is intramolecular, and so these molecules aren't really interacting with each other in the crystal form. Uh, whereas in this case, this hydroxyl group is going off and making some interaction with other molecules and so the molecules are more tightly associated and the, the melting point is higher so it was interesting to see that evidence presented as the proof of where the hydroxyl group was. And the last thing to do is to introduce the acetoxy group uh, by derivatizing this nitrile that was introduced in the cycloaddition. The first thing to do is the protection of the alcohol with uh, trimethylchlorosilane and triethylamine. So this is being protected as the trimethylsilyl ester, which is really quite a flimsy protecting group. It's very easy to remove, and if you want a more robust protecting group, you'd use something like TBDMS, but this is really a, a transient protection. It only needs to be present in one step. Uh, the next reaction was the uh, Grignard reaction with methyl magnesium iodide, and that adds in to the nitrile, just essentially as methyl minus here, pushes the electrons onto the nitrogen. And you can imagine the product of this reaction is an imine, uh, that's particularly unstable, and so it just hydrolyzes on the workup. Uh, the scientists here chose aqueous ammonium chloride as a, a very mild 
work up conditions because they were concerned about the acid or base sensitivity of the rest of the molecule, but this is sufficient to hydrolyze the ammonia imine uh, back to the ketone. Uh, and also in the same reaction step, the uh, very weak uh, TMS ether is also cleaved to regenerate our hydroxy group here. The final part then is how to convert the acetyl group into the acetoxy group. We need to introduce an oxygen. And this was accomplished by the uh, Bayer-Villiger reaction. So reaction uh, with metachloroperbenzoic acid, you get the adduct such as this with the, uh, the per acid adding into the ketone, and then the oxygen lone pair pushes in. The most electron releasing group migrates, which in this case is essentially the entire rest of the molecule migrating onto this oxygen here. Metachlorobenzoate is our leaving group. Uh, and in 54% yield, the Biovilliger oxidation proceeds to insert the oxygen where we need it and give us the acetoxy group. And then the final step is just a straightforward deprotection. Uh, this required three atmospheres of hydrogen, but again, hydrogen with palladium on carbon. A reductive debenzylation reveals the free NH and completes the synthesis of Baogong Teng A. And they were able to obtain 250 milligrams of this compound, which is pretty respectable. Uh, eight steps and 8% overall yield from the starting materials.